and welcome to Absolutely Not. My name is Katrina Stroh. My pronouns are they, she, he, and I am so grateful that you are here with us today. You can learn more about me on my website, www.katrinastroll.com. Real quick, if you appreciate the work that I do here or elsewhere, please visit the Support the Mission page of my website. There are several options to choose from to support my work, so please choose just one. I am so sorry, Avery. The key words for this episode are exclusion, discrimination, and anti-Blackness. I encourage y'all to look up the definitions of these words and compare them to the definitions that you carry with you on a daily basis. If you need help comparing, please let me know. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp allows you to connect with one of 24,000 licensed therapists in a safe and private online environment. You pay a low flat fee for unlimited therapy with your therapist. Visit www.betterhelp.com slash absolutely not for more information and to get 10% off your first month. This link can be found in the show notes. Today's episode is titled, Design is for Black People Too. Ah, and this topic is brought by my amazing special guest, Kirk Bisola He Him. Kirk is a major fan of comic books that he loves to think inside the box. He spent his life creating compelling and innovative design solutions independently and in the corporate environment. He owns Mind the Font, trademark, a full service branding and packaging design company. He identifies as Black. Kirk, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, that was a great introduction. Uh, I, I am Kirk, so you got everything right there, that's perfect. <laughs> Um, and oh, real I, quick, real quick before we start, I'm sorry. Y'all, this is the coolest thing ever, but when Katrina invite, invites you onto her show, their show, they send you a cup, send you a notebook and binder, which I'm taking notes in just to make sure I get my speaking points and we, we respond to things properly. Uh, and I'm so thankful for this. Thank you so much. I'm drinking uh, sparkling water out of here, believe it or not. It's, it's not fireball or whiskey or rum. Just, just some sparkling water. So thank you. <laughs> oh, I really fucking hate when people do that because <laughs> that, oh. I, no, not not like that. But um, oh. <laughs> I don't send. Just so everybody knows, yes, every special guest does get a box like that. But it's just because the information that you're about to share in this space is so fucking invaluable. Mm. This is just a small token of what I can share with you. And so with that, let's start spending some knowledge. Why are we All talking right. about? why design is for black people too. Uh, well, I have grown up, like I said, I grew up watching comics and or reading comic books and everything else. And you can see behind me, I'm still a big nerd. Um, and I love, love watching the ink and the pictures mixed with type on the page. And it was just so intriguing to me. So when I, in my bio, I say, I think inside the box is that there, I grew up reading comics and there's so much diversity from a character development, from layout development and everything else inside that box. And I had no idea though, that that's all related to graphic design, layouts and things of that nature until I met my ex-wife. And considering that there is only about 3% roughly of designers that are black, um, it's a hard field to get into much less back then, 20 something years ago, right? So I learned about it through through my ex and I just kind of gravitated to it. My father outlaw, my ex's dad, who I still talk to, was the head of creative services at ENJ Gallo. And so I had a mentor there that I didn't know what a valuable resource that would be. So be able to bounce ideas off and things of that nature. Now, if someone helped me through this journey that I didn't even know existed, and that's how I got into it, just, just by happenstance. And I think that the awareness surrounding technical things and digital things and anything in the arts field or communications and arts and um, from software and special abilities, uh, I think special abilities, is that a word? And things of that nature, right? Like that's something that isn't really, wasn't really prevalent back then, but it's becoming a little bit better now as far as teaching uh, people of color, black and brown kids, uh, how to, uh, you know, explore that field or pursue that field now. And I'm just thankful that I had the chance to. And I just think that more people 
need to understand how this works, especially people who are black and brown. Like, you can do this. If you like to do graffiti, if you like to do um, photography, if you like to do drawing or sketching or doodling, there's a spot for you. If you like to work on the computer and make things in Photoshop, self-taught, there's a spot for you. There's always a spot for you, but you have to know that there's going to be obstacles. And those are the obstacles where I say that design is for Black people too, is because even if you don't fit the mold of the 71% white male ran industry, you can still find your niche in there. And it's, and it's not easy, but you can still do it. So many thoughts, so many thoughts, but I, I, I thank you so much for bringing that here, especially with the statistics, because people love people who are the majority of that field would love to say, oh, no, we're diverse. We have hella people. The numbers say differently. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that was that was numbers I got from the design census.org sign census survey. They interviewed or they surveyed about 9,949 people. And those were the numbers. It was 3% that were black, 30% um, were Asian, so mainly like Filipino Asian, and then 71% white males dominated like all the, the departments, like those were the heads of the department, 71%. And I was just like, damn, that makes sense. I can't even think of a black teacher I had growing up, much less a black head of creative services somewhere. And you see a lot of fashion designers, like Virgil who just passed away and there's other designers like that nature, but it wasn't prevalent for when I, when I was designing. So yeah, it's, it's staggering. It's crazy. Like I just, it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people who share our identities, they may see those numbers and immediately think, oh, then that feels not for me. Like that's not for mm -hmm. me at all. What are some of the thoughts or phrases that you had to tell yourself to be like, no, this shit is for me? Phrases that I have to tell myself. I, there's a phrase that sticks with me. It was given to me by my first boss supervisor. And it is, you're good at this shit, just fucking do it. And that sounds, it sounds silly, but it's just like that, that, confirmation or reaffirmation that you are good at what you do you just need to do stuff and not worry about how it's going to turn out because bottom line what we do as designers and everything else there's there's no life or death situation that a designer has to deal with there's nothing in your day regardless of missing a deadline missing a press run missing whatever like those are big deals sometimes from a monetary standpoint but nobody dies like you're not like my wife's a speech therapist and she deals with people who've had strokes, people who have dementia, people who've had injuries, head injuries, usually older people, and, and they're going to pass along soon, but she's trying to get things, you know, going. I don't know how many times I've been told, you know, my, my patient went to the hospital today and I, I'm sad about it. I said, oh, well, my pencil broke. Like there's no comparison, right? Like or I had a file crash. Like it's not, there's no life or death there. And I think that that's the, the confidence that you need to gain as as a creative is that just be creative you can find your niche study if you want to figure out other people that do things that you like try to try to do something that you like to do and just keep keep grinding for lack of a better term just create and try to have fun mm -hmm. and i appreciate that affirmation I'm, I'm 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 gonna keep it with me like you can do this shit you have been doing this shit you don't need confirmation from other people. Just continue to do it. I love that so much. There are a lot of people who are going to hear these words from you and are still going to be afraid to continue to do this work, specifically Black people, because there's this fucking box that people like to place Black people in. Like Black people are not allowed to be creative. Black Facts. people aren't allowed to be loud or Black people aren't allowed to do these types of fields. Facts. When did you learn that that was a lie? when I had people who were really good in the field telling me that I was good and you know that Netflix doc documentary with Cap right Colin Kaepernick you need that white man's seal of approval right and it sounds shitty to say but it's kind of true and you also need other people in your field to give you that seal of approval people you look up to like I don't know how many times I've 
I email people or talk to people on LinkedIn and they say, oh, what do you do? And I say, and I just send them the email or the link, the URL to my, to my company. And they're like, oh, this is really good. I'm like, oh, thank you. And they're just shocked at like, wow, this is great. Because most designers, when you think of designers, you don't think of me. Like I'm, I'm loud, I'm smart ass, I, I cuss a lot or whatever. And I'm kind of like crazy, but I need to stop using that word. It's an ableist word. I mean, eliminate from vocabulary. So I do a lot of things that are just off the wall and never everything else. And people are used, used to seeing the stereotypical white dude with glasses, right? And I worked for a company and people from Malaysia came over and I was doing work and they said, oh, you're Kirk? I thought you were some white guy with glasses. It's just that stereotype that you always fit, right? And I kind of laughed and I was like, well, I can't blame you for thinking that. But it's not all of us that have to be that way. We don't have to fit into that mold to be that corner. Just it's the one field where doing good work usually helps, usually helps. I, you know what, what's really fucked up is I didn't even my profile picture up until like two years ago. I just had my logo on all my shit because I didn't want anybody to know I was black. I wanted to see my work and judge my work rather than automatically excluding me from doing anything for their company or their work because I'm black. And that's, that's the game that we have to play as black people. Like, how do you fit into this white supremacist woman world by not being yourself? Like, it's, it's so difficult. It's so difficult to walk that line. And then I realized I'm at the point now where if people want to work with me, fine. I'm really fucking good at what I do. You want to work with me, fine. fine. I'm going to speak my mind. I'm going to talk about, you know, women's rights, about the Supreme Court. I'm going to talk about anything else that I want to talk about in regards to helping and uplifting marginalized people. And if they don't like it, that's who I am. It doesn't detract from the fact that I'm really good, but I'm also a person too. I'm a person who's had a struggle, who's come up in this community and come up in this society as a person of color, and who's had to navigate everything, the way I speak, being told that I might be getting louder, aggressive, being told that um, you need to calm down, being told everything else. When you see other people who are doing the exact same shit, but because of how they look, is not reflected upon the same way. And I I've learned that lesson and I just try to carry myself in the best way possible now. I'm unapologetically me. I'm, gonna, I'm the nicest asshole you've ever met. It's how I like to describe myself, right? Like, that's just me. Mm, and we appreciate it. I appreciate <laughs> it, which is why you are in this space. I think, well, I'm happy to be here. I think about all the phrases we are taught when we're transitioning from like college or high school into the corporate space or to get our first job. And it's always phrases like fake it till you make it or just try to get your foot in the door or some shit like that. And what it's really saying is like, you, how you are, needs to change in order to be, to do what you want to do. Yes. Yes. And, and, and the fake it till you make it, I see that more as a skill set for most people. But with Black people, it's not only a skill set, it's, it's the way we have to navigate in ourselves in this world. It's the way we have to carry ourselves. It's the way we have to be spoken. My mother was a a very strict grammarian, right? She would get on us if we used improper language. She would let us know that, you know, that's not how you say that. It's he and I, it's, you know, and she would literally correct us all the time. And it doesn't mean that like when I'm hanging out with my boys, I can talk however I want, right? But she knew that we would automatically be judged by how we looked, we even opened our mouths. So when I speak to somebody and they're expecting me to say nigga, nigga, shit, fuck, whatever, like they're not expecting a quote unquote eloquent white language assessment, right? They don't expect to go to somebody with a, um, a vocabulary, I can't words right now, go to somebody with a vocabulary uh, that's more expounding and ex expansive than like two or three words. and. They don't know how to act when people do that to you. And my, my mom knew this. She knew we would be judged. So she tried to make sure that even from a language standpoint, that's like the most common thing in any society, any place you go, if you can speak someone's language, you can usually get through to them in a better way. And she knew that. 
And so that's that's also think helped, I think. But still, I, I tell people all the time, if I was white, I'd be running some Fortune 50 company right now for the creative space, just because I know who I am and I know what I'm capable of. And it's it's not it's not bragging, it's not, you know, saying my ego's out of control. It's just factual. I know that for a fact that I would be. And I now I'm just kind of settled to where I just want to have fun and do stuff and work with people I like. And that's that's the big thing right now. I want to work with people I like and people I admire. And I, I don't want to work for jerks anymore. Mm. Oh, and this is a decision that you are making on a personal, on a professional, on a business level. Like this is the type of life that I want to live. I will no longer um, like just to stretch myself thin in order to fit into some box that somebody wants me to fit in. Have you ever had a, um, an inquiry or a potential client say, we would work with you if you did X, Y, Z, instead of how you live your life now? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> just, just, just to re- reemphasize the name of this, this show. Uh, no, cause they know. I've had people try to nickel and dime me on work that needed to be done and automatically that's a no-no for me trusting your gut and trusting an intuition and women have this women have always had this because they live in a predatory environment based upon legislation that's put on them based upon the fact that they walk around at night and they are seen as prey period so when women sense something's wrong they will automatically know to get out of it usually there's domestic situations and I'm trying to woman explain to you, sorry, but there's situations where there's automatically a threat that's happening and, and they're able to assess it and leave. And I'm realizing that in the workspace for myself, I also have to be wary of people who are taking advantage of my skills or trying to take advantage of my skills and be ready to just walk away. I mean, there's been times where I've walked away from pretty good money just because I didn't want to work with the person. And I knew going into it that it was going to be a headache. And the time that I would go work for them, that person, I would realize, no, I can't do this and then pull out. So there's, there's all kinds of stuff like that. But no, people know now, if they, see my, they see my LinkedIn page, they have a conversation with me. And every single interview, if you ever hear me on my podcast or anything, I always talk like this. This is who I am. This is in the front. This is just who I am. I talk to everybody, little kids, babies. It's like, I'll talk to you this way. Uh, so this is just me. And if you don't like it, then find someone else. All the best. All the best. I love that. And it reminds me of like the templates that I have set up when anyone reaches out for anything like, okay, Katrina, you, they sound like a nice person, but we do have fucking templates set up. So send the template. Don't move from the script because then they're going to end up being not a nice person. And you're like, damn, I should have stuck to the script. Do you have any templates or scripts that you use whenever someone reaches out? Yeah. Usually I just have a conversation to see where they are. And then I get, they say, so how much do you think that would cost? And I would say, well, I'll have to set up a proposal and get back to you. I don't like to give numbers over the phone right away because I don't know what's involved. Um, and, and oftentimes I'll ask what's their budget just so we don't waste people's time. But from there, I write a proposal and lay things out and then send it over to them and have them assess and get it back. But I think that having a phone call oftentimes really gives you a feel of how someone will um, be able, will, will be to work with. Sometimes though, it is a little bit deceiving because you don't work for the person who you talk to on the phone, you work for someone else. I was working for a winery, which will go unnamed, um, smaller winery in Napa, but the guy I was working with, in the, working with ended up getting fired in the middle of me working with him. And I called him, I said, what's up? He's like, oh yeah, uh, I'll give you a pseudonym, Dale. Dale uh, fired me, I said, well, Dale sounds really not nice. And so Dale ends up calling me because I ended up backing out of the job after my friend got fired. I'm like, I'm not going to work for them if they fired you. I don't want to work with anybody else. So I gathered up all the work that I had done so far. 
and I sent over the files, working files, so they can have any designer pick it up and make changes accordingly. And I get a call from Dale. So, hey, uh, hey, Kirk, uh, this is Dale. Oh, what's up, man? How you doing? Good, good, yeah, yeah. Apparently, you're just walking out on us and quitting. I said, uh, no. I said, I have a job starting up soon on Monday, which I did, but I could have done both and whatever. I was just trying to be nice about it. And he says, well, you know, um, you know, it's, it's kind of something you just leave us high and dry. You're leaving us high and dry with nothing going on. And I really don't appreciate that. I said, well, I sent over the files and he kept going off. And I was literally two seconds from telling that motherfucker off. Like, listen here, young man. Uh, and he wasn't young, he was old, but I felt like talking to him like a child. Son! Um, but no, I, I sat there and listened to him. And then finally he got the, the idea that I had already sent over the files and I was just asking to be paid for my services. He goes, oh, okay, well, that's fine, fine. Hey, you know what? Have a nice life. And then he hung up. And I'm thinking, dude, there's a reason why your dad ran the company and you didn't, you spoiled little prick. Um, and I never talked to him since. And I can tell you who it is offline because it's kind of funny because it's a well-known story. The CEO, his son, owns the winery and he's just a total asshole. But anyway... Yeah, so there are times where <laughs> I don't want to work with assholes. And I trust my gut. And I should have, and I did then, and it paid off because I didn't want to work for that guy. My goodness. Um, a perfect example, especially in your field, like there are so many exit points, exit points. You can create an exit strategy. You're like, all right, I only know one person at this company. If this person leaves, this is my exit strategy. If mm -hmm. I have to leave, in the middle of this project, this is how much y'all are going to pay me and be communicative about that. And it's funny because as soon as you start setting boundaries with people or start expressing how you feel about the work that's being done or the communication that's happening, people act exactly like that. And they're like, oh shit, this is exactly why. This is exactly entitled, why. entitled, <laughs> entitled people. They, they do it all the time. And, you know, one of the one of the prelim questions you asked about speaking towards boundaries was, you know, how do you set boundaries? And for me, that's, that's, I have to think of it in terms of rules and regulations. There are societal rules and norms usually associated with how you should treat people. And it varies from person to person. Um, I can joke with one of my friends a certain way and I can really go dark and really say some terrible, heinous things, but they understand my sense of humor and they understand that that's not who I am. And I, but I know I can't talk to everybody that way because there's certain boundaries and boundaries mean how far you go before you harm somebody, not offend, but harm. Offense is fucking subjective. It's subjective. I can find Blazing Saddles to be funny and someone can find it to be offensive. I can find any comic to be funny and someone can find them to be offensive. But it's not the offense, it's the harm that is done from the words that are said and the actions that are done. That's the thing that's really needs to be paid to with boundaries. How far do you go before you know you've crossed the line? And people will usually let you know. Uh, hopefully before it's too late and you've crossed it they kind of say hey you know let's let's back up a bit and and i'm not perfect i have to make sure that i'm continually trying to get better and correct myself if i say something wrong or do something wrong because there's the only way we grow is by learning and respecting other people's boundaries setting our own but learning to respect and other people's as well and i i hear this all the time on your show and i can't remember there was a woman who came on and was speaking towards working, working for a corporation and then losing her identity while she was working there because she basically became a different person from all the things that she had to do, all the bullshit that she had to take. And then the light bulb went off one day, like, what am I doing? And then from there on out, things changed for her. And she started setting boundaries and she started making sure that people knew what her limits are. Like, don't call me after this. I'm not going to respond to this email, things of that nature. And I think that we need to hold, hold true to those boundaries in order for us to grow and get better as well. Overall in society, I think that's, that's the key. Mm -hmm. 
you got it. Um, but <laughs> I love the point of I became a whole different person. So if you are not setting boundaries with people, you are becoming the person you believe that person is going to like and accept. We talked about, or we touched on a little bit about white advantage, which I will trademark that, but <laughs> white advantage and how white people don't have to do that as often. They don't have to do shit. They can talk to people how they want to. They can say, my daddy owns the company. They can do a lot of shit. When was yeah. the last time you had to check someone with advantage and let them know, I will not be changing into a whole nother person for you? Oh, damn. In real, <laughs> in real life? Oh my gosh. Man. It's, it's been a minute. On LinkedIn, it's almost daily. That's real life. <laughs> I mean, face to face. There's a lot of what I call telephone tough guys, right? That's just a generic term I've made up to where people are, will be typing on there calling you on the phone and talking all that mess when you call them out it's like, well I, you're, you're backtracking and everything else and there's a ton of that on linkedin and i had somebody tell me today you know there's no way you can prove that how, how do you know it's white supremacy oh yesterday how do you know it's white supremacy and i said dude if if i have to tell you a what you can google and b what's been talked about literally every day in this space for the last two years, three years, then we have bigger problems because I should not have to tell you this. So if you want to learn, go look it up. If you're, you're asking me a question to justify why I said something as opposed to actually understanding as to why I said it. So don't come on here telling me, can you explain it to me? No, go fuck yourself. I'm not going to explain shit to you. You can go find it yourself. I'm, I'm not, I'm not your, your errand boy. I'm not your, your teacher. You can go learn yourself if you really want to learn. And white people, someone said this, white people have no natural predator. They're at the top of the food chain. Like they have no natural predator. Who's gonna come up against them? They run a majority of congressional seats, of political seats, yet they're a minority in this country. But they are the ones that run it. And they are the ones who are being uplifted and upheld by white white privilege i.e white advantage because of the white supremacy that's so interwoven into our society i <laughs> mentioned white advantage to you because people are saying i didn't grow up privileged everybody oh my god i'm so tired of you semantic loving analytical over articulated picker of words from certain phrases so if I say assault rifle, people will say, oh, AR doesn't stand for assault rifle. It stands for apples and apple ranging, whatever the name of the company is for AR-15. Uh, <laughs> another one, global warming. There's stuff getting cold too. That doesn't mean anything, global warming. All these phrases and stuff, white privilege. I have never been privileged. I grew up and I had hardships. My dad had to work in a field and I grew up getting teased by people and because I was poor and it's like bruh if that's not what that means it just means it wasn't as hard on you because you're white had you been black it would have been, been even worse for you but that white coat that you have helped shield you from all the atrocities that we suffer and I I'm just tired of people correcting semantics so I said white advantage because you have an advantage over other people that aren't white. And that's just facts, period, plain and simple. So yes, white advantage. We should trademark that, Katrina. We should Ooh, do that. You, I did not come up with that. You brought that here. <laughs> and I, I love this because it's also undermining the intelligence of the person that you are um, asking for justification for, for their emotions or their experiences. And it's also saying like, you don't know the difference between me demanding education and a person being inquisitive, like gener genu bleh, generally curious, mm -hmm. which I fucking know. I know when someone is asking a question just to like literally learn about something. And usually people preface it with that, like, hey, no disrespect, no nothing. I literally just want to know. And, yeah. and we know the difference. So it's rude when mm -hmm. people are like, 
No, I just want to know to see if you know what I think you know that you know. <laughs> it's like, I, I want to skip all that. Just see what your talking point is <laughs> that you heard on Fox News. Just, just tell me what your talking point is because I don't want to have to sit there and argue with you. Let's just skip all the argument and get to the final part. Like, let's just have dessert, all right? Fuck the meal. Let's just get to the dessert because I'm tired. I'm tired of having to talk to someone to hear them say, and then you notice they all respond with like two paragraphs. You were like, waiting. Oh, you were mm -hmm. waiting. You had this copied and pasted from another post you had on Facebook. So get the fuck out of here with that. Uh, but yeah, that's 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 so true. That's so true. How are we doing on time? I want to be respectful of your time. You're good. So. Um, and so with that, there are going to be a lot of people that listen to this episode, and they're mm -hmm. going to say, and they're going to say, you know what? Fuck these people. I'm not having arguments with people no more. I'm going to start <laughs> asking people for dessert first. And yes. so for the people that are going to demand dessert first in their offices or for the, from their clients or in any design space that they're in, what would be the top three tips you would share with them mm. about asking for dessert first? Mm. Uh, put it in writing. So have a contract, have it signed. Get your money before you get started on something, unless... Here's the thing, unless it's someone that you know, like I've done work for people and I still do work for people that I know um, because I know they won't fuck me over. Like, and, and there has to be some level of trust, no matter what, as hard as it is, there has to be some level of trust in order to do things. But when you first start with a new client, and you're not sure, get that money, make sure you got your money secure. And the other thing I would say is Try to find, this is the hardest part, even for me now, try to find a happy medium between the client being happy and the product being good. Because a client oftentimes will not have good taste and they won't know. And I'm just saying this truthfully. They go off of what they like as opposed to what they need. So oh, I really like this. Okay, well, how does that help your brand? What you like? We have to separate your likes from your needs. And right now your brand needs X. So let's work on that and let's figure that out. And then once you present them something, have a great explanation. But bottom line, if the client wants to do whatever they want to do, just make sure you get paid. Like, so the dessert would be sign the contracts, get paid, and do what's best for the client. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The bare minimum, if you can, because you consulting them on like what they need to do this and this would help them better. They better pay you more. Like you, yeah. you giving more out of yourself than mm -hmm. what they signed on the dotted line is not needed. Give them nope. people what they asked for. And then if they want more con consultation, sign another paper. <laughs> yes. And that's hard. That's hard for me, especially because I'm, I always say this, I don't like people. I don't, but I am a people person and I'm, I'm a social introvert. Like I can do this for a while, but then I just gotta be by myself. But people and, and clients who I talk to, we usually have a, a pretty good, we usually hit it off pretty well. And it's hard for me to separate that from the actual business side sometimes. Um, and you have to be able to, to, stick, to, stick, to stick to your foundation and stick to what you know um, because bottom line at the end of the day, that's, what's going to get you through is, is being consistent in your values, setting those boundaries and making sure that people attain to those as well. They go by those guidelines and that you've set up. Mm. And look, I know y'all heard that he is being honest about who he is. He said he's a social introvert. So knowing that about himself, like, Hey, chill out. You like, you, I know that you like this person, but we do need money. The, ba the bank account does need to be filled. So let's reevaluate. Let's bring out those values again on our piece of paper and see where we are on the scale. Thank you so yes. much for being honest in this space. Are there any last minute sprinkles that you'd like to share with the audience? Uh, no, I, I guess the last minute sprinkle would be, I, I'm the dude that will get back to you if you text me or if you message me or email me but it has to be a real message it has to be something where we can have a conversation 
and talk to one another as opposed to at one another. So I don't want to get a message from you because I get them all the time. Hey, I heard you on Katrina's show. Um, would you would you mind jumping on a call so we can discuss how to further get clients for you in the future? As far as like, no, I'm not going to do that. But if you have a question about design, about anything design related or life or whatever, text me or email me or whatever. I'll get back to you. Message me. I'll get back to you. I think it's important. And I usually, most people I get back to, like, oh, Maestro Stevens, look him up. Uh, young dude, just had a kid. Congrats, Maestro. He's starting his own business, uh, doing web websites and doing branding and everything else. Really sharp kid. And he asked me, hey, Kirk, and we have a conversation. I text him. He texts me. I just see how he's doing sometimes just to keep up with him. Because I think that's important. There is enough room for everybody. Everybody can get a piece of the pie. So don't, don't think that you have to be the only one in the space. Celebrate wins for everybody. Celebrate wins for a friend. Celebrate wins for anybody and everybody. Because when good people win, we all win. That's what we need to focus on. So that's my nugget. Text me, I'll get back to you. And I'm always rooting for you. As long as you're not an asshole. Because then you fuck off. <laughs> Everyone, I hope you felt that. That felt like a big warm hug. Like I have somebody rooting for me and so do y'all. Just so y'all know, Kirk's information will be in the show notes when this is published. So just click on it, reach out. Like he said, I'm so excited for everybody who's going to be able to hear this amazing conversation. To anybody who's listening to this, keep setting those boundaries and saying absolutely not to everything unaligned. We will see you next time. Bye. Peace. Peace.